Good evening, friends, and welcome back to ASMR Leadership, where I read to you from books with a leadership or personal development perspective, because spoken word ASMR, gentle page turning, and mouth sounds help me to relax, and I trust the same is true for you, too. Also, my feeling is that if you're going to invest the time into a long ASMR video, that you should at least come away having learned something. And tonight was a very long day at the office, so I've already been drinking. Had some amazing beer earlier tonight, and I'm tempting fate by mixing my alcohols. I've gone from a an imperial stout beer and am now going to indulge in a glass of my Lafroig Triple Wood Isla Scotch or Isla I guess is how it's supposed to be pronounced this is a single malt scotch from the Isla region of Scotland it is, it is a heavily peated whiskey which means it punches you in the mouth it's not a uh, it's not a an easy going delicious sipping whiskey that a lot of people will gravitate toward but instead it's one that you really kind of have to have a taste for and already being half lit um, feels like a good night for Lefroy Now, I'm going to get even a little bit more crazy. Please excuse the loud car outside. I'm going to get a little bit more crazy because recently I found a video from Whiskey Tribe. These are a couple of guys out of Austin, Texas that produce some really great whiskey content. They talk about not only scotch whiskeys, but Irish whiskeys and bourbons and mixed and single malt and, um, or sorry, blended, um, and single malt whiskeys, all kinds of whiskeys, and they know what the hell they're talking about. If I know this much, they know that much. They know a lot. And on one of their recent videos, they explored the idea of adding salt whiskey to change the flavor profile. So uh, in my current condition, I am going to experiment with some salt in my Lafroig. Yeah. Okay. So they didn't add very much to theirs, and this is just common table salt. See that? And I'm going to go another loud car. One, two, three tiny little shakes, and then mix it around. Let's make sure it's all dissolved here. And it's not quite. So the idea here is that some flavors in your whiskey will be enhanced by the salt. And hopefully they're the right flavors. It seems very odd to put salt in a whiskey because you don't want it end up, to end up tasting like salt water. That's just not why you would drink it. I'm a little 
shell-shocked. I don't really even taste the salt. But, so with a, with a peated whiskey like this, <coughs> from the Isla region, um, you know, Lafroig and Ardbeg and a few others are like the big Isla scotch names. And with this Lafroig triple wood in particular, when you first, when you first drink it, you'll notice that it kind of fights you on the way down. It's, it's very sharp. Um, you have to really work to enjoy it. Um, and I know how that sounds. But with just the littlest bit of salt added into it, I don't really taste the salt, but the, the aggressiveness of this whiskey is kind of flattened out a little bit. Rather than really fighting you, it's a bit smoother. It's like the sharp edges have been sanded off a little bit. Wow. I think I really like that. And I am shocked. I did not expect that to be the case. But after watching that video from Whiskey Tribe, and again, those guys are entertaining as hell. If you like whiskey, not just ASMR or leadership, but if you like whiskey, check out Whiskey Tribe. They have a second channel too, um, which is called the Whiskey Tasting Room or something like that. I'll have to look it up before I mention it again. Um, Daniel and Rex are their names, and they are really fun guys. Wow. Way to go, guys. I'm shocked. Oh, by the way, here's to you for joining me tonight. Thank you very much. I am just flabbergasted. That's a really cool trick. <laughs> Impressed. Okay. I have a feeling that in my current condition, I'm not going to last very long tonight, so this video might end up being kind of short. And I planned on diving into chapter 6 of Leaders Eat Last from Simon Sinek. end up buying too much and buying
buying things we don't really need. I've been there. We buy too much because everything we see, we want to eat now. Because we're hungry, that's obvious. But the more interesting question is, why do we go to the supermarket when we are not hungry? Our ancestors of the Paleolithic era lived in times when resources were either scarce or hard to come by. What's the difference, Simon? Scarce and hard to come by are kind of the same thing, aren't they? Imagine if every time we felt hungry, we had to go hunting for a few hours with no guarantee that we'd catch anything. Odds are our species would not have survived very well with a system like that. And so our bodies, in an effort to get us to repeat behaviors that are in our best interest, came up with a way to encourage us to go hunting and gathering on a regular basis instead of waiting until we were starving. Two chemicals, endorphins and dopamine, are the reason that we are driven to hunt, gather, and achieve. They make us feel good when we find something we're looking for, build something we need, or accomplish our goals. These are the chemicals of progress. E is for endorphins, the runner's high. Endorphins serve one purpose and one purpose only, to mask physical pain. That's it. Think of endorphins as our own personal opiate. Often released in response to stress or fear, they mask physical pain with pleasure. The experience of a runner's high, the feeling of euphoria many athletes experience during or after a hard workout, is in fact the endorphin chemical surging through their veins. This is one of the reasons runners and other endurance athletes continue to push their bodies harder and harder. It is not simply because they have the pleasure, I'm sorry, it's not simply because they have the discipline to do so. They do it because it actually feels good. They love and sometimes crave the amazing high they can achieve from a hard workout. The biological reason for endorphins, however, has nothing to do with exercise. It has to do with survival. More whiskey. That is so interesting. I'm going to do that again. Salt in my beaded whiskey. Who would have thought? Thank you, Whiskey Tribe. Thank you. The caveman application of the chemical feel-good is far more practical. Because of endorphins, humans have a remarkable capacity for physical endurance. Save for all the marathoners out there, most of us can't imagine running for miles and miles on a regular basis. But that's exactly what gave our ancestors an edge while hunting during the Paleolithic era. They were able to track an animal over great distances, and then still have the stamina to make it home again. If the trusty hunters gave up at any time simply because they were exhausted, then they and those in their tribe would not eat very often and would eventually die off. And so, Mother Nature designed a clever incentive to encourage us to keep going. A little endorphin rush. We can actually develop a craving for endorphins. That's why people who are in the habit of regular exercise sometimes crave going for a run or getting to the gym to help them relax, especially after 
a stressful work day. That's probably a healthier habit than drinking whiskey. I don't feel much like a workout right now, though. Our ancestors probably wanted to go hunting and gathering, not simply because they know they had to, but because it often felt good to go. Again, the human body wants us to feel good, and when we go looking for food, or when we are doing the hard work of building shelter so that we will more likely do it. Thanks to cars and supermarkets, however, we live in a world with readily available and abundant resources. Abundant resources. The body no longer rewards the search for food, at least not with endorphins. In this day and age, we basically get our endorphin hits from exercise or manual labor, with at least one notable exception. Stephen Colbert, political satirist and the host of The Colbert Report, commented during an interview on the importance of laughter in these times. As a reminder, this book was published in 2014, back when Stephen Colbert was still hosting The Colbert Report on Comedy Central. Uh, quote, You can't laugh and be afraid at the same time, he said, and he'd be right. Laughing actually releases endorphins. They are released to mask the pain we're causing to ourselves as our organs are being convulsed. We like laughing for the same reason runners like running. It feels good. But we've all had experiences of laughing so much, we want it to stop because it starts to hurt. Like the runner, the hurt actually began earlier, but thanks to the endorphins, we didn't feel it until later. It is the high we get which continues after the laughing has ceased that makes it hard to be, as Colbert says, afraid at the same time. During these tense times, a little lightheartedness may go a long way to help relax those around us and reduce tensions so that we can focus on getting our jobs done. As President Ronald Reagan famously joked with the chief surgeon on March 30th, 1981, as he was wheeled into the operating room at George Washington University Hospital after being shot by John Hinckley, Jr. Quote, I hope you're all Republicans. To which the surgeon, a self-described liberal Democrat, replied, Quote, We're all Republicans today, Mr. President. is for dopamine, an incentive for progress. <clears throat> dopamine is the reason for the good feelings we get when we find when we find something we're looking for or do something that needs to get done. It is responsible for the feeling of satisfaction after we've finished an important task completed a project, reached a goal, or even reached one of the markers on our way to a bigger goal. We all know how good it feels to cross something off our to-do list. That feeling of progress or accomplishment is primarily because of dopamine. Long before agriculture or supermarkets, humans spent a good portion of their time in search of the next meal if we couldn't stay focused on completing basic tasks, like hunting and gathering, we wouldn't last very long. So Mother Nature designed a clever way to help us stay focused on the task at hand. One way we get dopamine is from eating, which is one of the reasons we enjoy it, and we try to repeat the behaviors that get us food. It is dopamine that makes us 
as a goal-oriented species with a bias for progress. When we are given a task to complete, a metric to reach, as long as we can see it clearly or imagine in our mind's eye, we will get a little burst of dopamine to get us on our way. Back in the Paleolithic era, if someone saw a tree filled with fruit, for example, dopamine was released to incentivize them to stay focused on the task and to go get the food. Please excuse the military invasion that is apparently happening outside. I don't know why there is a helicopter hovering somewhere nearby but it sure doesn't seem to be going anywhere. I hope my mic is picking up just enough of it to feel kind of distant and relaxing for you. Very strange. Okay, back to the dopamine discussion. As they made progress toward that fruit tree, they would see it getting slightly bigger, an indication they were getting closer, and with each sign of progress, they would get another little hit of dopamine to keep them on their way. And another, and another, until they got a big hit when they finally reached their goal. Eureka! It's the same for us. As we get closer to our goals, the metrics tell us we're making progress, and we gather another little hit to keep us going. Then, finally, when we reach our goal, that intense feeling of, got it, is a big hit of dopamine, our biological reward for all that hard work. Each milestone we pass is a metric, a way to see the fruit tree is getting closer and closer like a marathon runner who passes each mile marker toward the finish line, our bodies reward us with dopamine so that we will keep going, working even harder to reach that huge pot of dopamine, that intense feeling of accomplishment at the end. Obviously, the bigger goal, the more effort it requires. The bigger the goal, more effort it requires, the more dopamine we get. This is why it feels really good to work hard to accomplish something difficult, while doing something quick and easy may only give us a little hit, if anything at all. In other words, it feels good to put in a lot of effort to accomplish something. There is no biological incentive to do nothing. So the next subsection of this chapter is quite long, and I'm feeling it, so I think I'm going to end the video for tonight. I have my Amazon gift card bookmark. That's going to go right there. I am going to finish my salted Laphroaig triple wood beaded whiskey. whiskey. Uh, 
in a way that is super enjoyable. Um, I'm loving it. It's very strange. Unexpected. And I'm loving it. Wow. Alright. Thank you again. There's a big hit of not dopamine, but single malt scotch whiskey. Which means it's bedtime. <clears throat> Six, the beginning at least of chapter six, part one of chapter six of Leaders Eat Last from Simon Sinek. I hope you're enjoying it so far. We will continue chapter six in the next video, and I will see you at that time. Quick reminder if you're getting some value out of these videos, to like the videos, subscribe to the channel. Click the notification button, bell, whatever it's called. Lots of drinking tonight. Click the notification bell down there. And leave comments and whatnot on these videos. And uh, all of those efforts will help the channel grow. And for that, I thank you for your efforts in helping me help the channel grow. Okay, enough rambling. Good night. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.